All right, now that we're recording, anything and everything I say is available. <laughs> Can and will be used against you. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, all right. Um, am I able to share content yet, Jay? Should be able to. I can promote you if not. There you go. Right. You got the ball. All right, let's just dive into this. Let's get PowerPoint. that one all right are you able to see let's get to the yep. top here like one says Freddy multicast yep that's the one all right all right so Jay thank you for um, asking me to come on here so I tried to put together I've got a slide deck and a few other sites and information, right? So a lot of this is gonna be driven by where we wanna go with all of this, right? Because with with wireless, I mean, Cisco's made a lot of changes, right? Um, I think a lot of us all know that the uh, Air OS that we have, we've had for 15 years, a lot of development, a lot of things that we've done in there, um, and that's changed, right? Where where we have gone with uh, the Catalyst line, now we have the 9800 controllers, the 9100 access points. A lot of that has all changed um, to give more to that conversation of the intent-based network, right? So let's go. Oh, look at that. Intent-based networking. <laughs> Well-timed. Yes. So, I mean, it, it's interesting how everything is kind of going towards how do things play together, right? How do uh, different systems integrate and feed and basically help, right? I mean, it all comes back to um, in an environment when we're making decisions and choices, how does it feed the other stuff, right? So when I think of like intent-based networking, to me, it, it all comes back to how do those different different systems play into each other, right? So a lot of what they've done with the, with the wireless is is with the changes we've made with where we're going, it is all around how do we leverage ICE, right? How does ICE feed into it? How does StealthWatch feed into it? How do all of these different components work together to be able to make better in the environment and decisions from wireless and wired, right? All right, so I beat that horse to death. All right, so here's all the different lines, right? So everyone knows of the different uh, 92, 93s, 94s, 95s, but we're today, we're gonna focus on the 9800 controllers and then uh, I'll hit on some access points. Um, typically, when it comes to the access points, I'm a 9120, 9130 guy. That's typically where I stay, and I'll hit on that later because uh, a lot of that comes to the RF ASIC that we have in that. So, but I have I have a slides around that because I think I, I really like hitting on that because it's unique, right? I mean, there's a lot of cool stuff around it. All right. Ooh, look at that animation! Did you catch that? That's fancy. Yeah, Not yeah. Even that... on my DSL connection, so <laughs> you know, the intent-based <laughs> networking is, is is a great segue into this. I mean, we talked about ISRs on here, and we talked about the Catalyst 92, 9300s. Um, we haven't really talked about SDA, you know, software-defined access. We haven't really talked about software-defined networking or IBN or SD WAN yet. You know, we'll we'll dive into all those topics eventually, but it all plays together in in that idea you kind of touched on that users are moving around, right? We can't really make rules based on IP addresses and devices and switch ports anymore. Um, a user that's sitting here at their house today, probably in, in this environment, will be sitting in a different building next week, maybe on wireless two weeks from now, maybe in a coffee shop VPN in two months from now. Um, but we want them to be able to access all the same thing. So that's kind of how the intent-based networking all plays together. And, uh, you know, I've, I've kind of beat the iOS XE message to death you know, now that we're using that operating system everywhere, but wireless is a part of that too, you know, and that modularity um, is really what brings that whole intent-based picture together. Yeah, and, and, and I, I like that, that the comment on the modularity, right? I mean, that, that's key because, 
I mean, environments don't have the same SLAs that they used to have, right? I mean, when you think of wireless, I mean, when I when we were first, I can remember when doing my first wireless, it was it was guest, maybe a conference room, right? I mean, it was very small, very unique, um, and now um, it has changed so much. I mean, it, it wireless is is so much more a part of our lives than than um, the years past, right? And it really comes down to, um, and it's a beautiful thing, right? Technology has changed, it's evolved, it's been great. It's it, apparently my wife tells me it's given me some gray hairs, which I, I told her she was lying. She has no idea what she's talking about, but it, it's evolved and changed and it's gotten to, to where wireless is mission critical, right? I mean, you look at your hospitals. I mean, they're taking carts between rooms. They're they're able to track stuff. It, it all comes down to um, building an environment where it's up more, right? And the whole modularity OS piece allows us to be able to increase availability so the environment runs um, closer to a 24 by seven, right? Because I mean, it, it seems more and more that those change windows that we get are are small, right? You don't get the, oh, it's it's Saturday. You've got Saturday and Sunday to make all your changes, right? That doesn't happen anymore. All right. So, with that, I mean that that's that's the before your plan downtimes. Um, now we we don't get that as much, right? And then when we talk secure, right? I mean threat detection, right? I mean that goes back to the whole stealth watch piece that we talked about. Um, deploying anywhere, right? Now it's it's a um, your wireless is is everywhere within your environment, right? You get your flex connects, right? So you have a remote location, but you want all the traffic drop there, right? So you've got flex connected those sites, but you centrally manage it, right? Or maybe you have a, a controller that's out there. It, it all depends on that architecture that you want to have, and then it's the integration, right? I mean, we've got our DNA center. Um, that ours ties into, but it's it's the APIs that we have out there and it's being able to integrate it with the different pieces to feed information. So that way um, it's another tool that can send information to another tool to get better information, right? Which that doesn't, it just sounds really stupid, but I mean. <laughs> No, it, it makes sense. I mean, we, we talk a lot about DNA Center because that's our product, but um, having that programmability in the open APIs, you can leverage th that in many different ways, you know, to, to integrate that in the tools you have today or to, to homebrew scripts, um, something we, we touched on with nearly all the products we've talked about with, with iOS XE. Uh, the programmability, I mean, everybody knows that that's the direction this, this industry is going. Um, that's why we released the CCNA DevNet certs, right? Like, <laughs> yes. there, there's two types of network engineers. Either you're doing some scripting today or uh, you, you will be soon. <laughs> yeah. You know what? And, and it's funny that you say that is, you know, when I look back on some of the whole APIs and, and doing all that programming piece, I always look back at, you know, we were always, we always were programming, right? I mean, I always wrote my scripts in Word, right, or Notepad, right? And I would always have everything in there, and it was always copy and pasting into your CLI, right? And you always knew when you did too many, right? Because you'd get the carrot, and everything would fail, and you're like, oh, I got to scroll back up and see where it failed at. But yeah, I mean, I I, I always argue that we've been doing it for for years. All right. All right. So this is the different 9800s and the different controllers that we have, right? So we've got embedded into uh, the actual access points themselves, right? So there is a code version that we can run to where your access points can act as a controller and then other APs connect to it, right? Um, as you can see here, 100 APs, 2000 clients. You have the embedded into the catalyst line. Um, Yeah, I'm on top of that. 9300s. For... <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, I'm not going to talk have, on that one. <laughs> we, we may have had a salty history there, um, but it, it looks better going forward. I think going back to the, the embedded controllers on the, the 9800 WAPs, um, that's so much more robust than it used to be, right? We used to only be able to support really small branches, like five WAPs. Um, hardly any business anywhere can survive on five WAPs anymore, right? Even our smallest branches need five WAPs or more. Um, yes. So I think 
think, you know, the, the capability of being able to go up to 100 APs, 2,000 clients, that's pretty robust. That's really come a long ways. It, it is, and it's pretty cool. You know, the code version that you run on there and then how you go in and then configure it to where you have a primary and an HA one, right? And the, the it is pretty cool. Um, they have come a long way. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'll, I'll, I'm biased. I am still a a 9800L or the 40 or the 80, right? Those are, they're the old school appliances, right? They're the old iron, right? I mean, so for me, I typically go to there. Uh, those are the ones that I typically like. Um, but you, you hit it, right? So many of these locations, five, six access points. And it's really hard to go to the business and be like, oh, I need a 9800L for five access points of location, right? Um, so a lot of that comes back to the business justification and what your budgets are, right? So, um, but that embedded controller in, in, in the 9800, in the access points is, is cool. All right, so uh, you can, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, I see the 9800CL on there too, um, the virtualized options, right? Lots of folks go in that direction. Yep. And and with that, so when you start doing the CLs, uh, you start getting to uh, where you're hosting out of the cloud, right? Um, it can work for you, right? Because at that point, when you're doing that, you're doing the concept of you're dropping it off local, right? So that is the, the Flex Connect configuration that you're leveraging, right? Um, so then at that point, it, it really is just a central controller to manage your environment. Um, so that way you have a standard configuration around everything, right? So it works. Um, again, it, it, it's all based on the business, right? So maybe you've gone a little bit more cloud. That That's going to fit perfect for what you're doing, right? If you still have your hardened data centers that you have, well, then maybe a more traditional route would be the way to go. But as you can see here, from an access point embedded in switches or in the cloud or hard iron, you've got options on what you want to do. So it's, it's pretty cool. And configuration wise, I mean, these are all pretty much the same. It's all iOS XE. They can be uh, remotely managed via web UI. They can be remotely managed via DNA center. So um, from yes. a management perspective, pretty much all the options are the same. Yes, 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 yes. All right. All right. Now this gets back to kind of where we had hit on uh, from a management perspective here. So, right. So this, this slide just basically hits on that again, where Cisco's got their DNA center, but then you got operabilities between all these other pieces, right? I mean, the whole Yang, Python, that's the big one with the whole iOS XE piece, right? It plays right into that, where, you know, that that concept of how you're doing it from your switches is exactly where you're going to be able to go with these uh, controllers. So it's pretty cool. All right, flip past that. Uh, y catalyst, yes, we gotta have this, right? So I think everyone can read the why. It's automating, right? I mean, the whole. A lot of times we talk about the day zero, the day one, the day two, all of that piece, right? It comes back to, can I develop an architecture? Can I build a standard? And can I operationalize it, right? Those are the things that, to me, from a a architect engineer perspective, that I always thought, right? How can I take a solution? build it and then get it so that way I can empower a desktop team or a help desk team to be able to understand the environment and be able to leverage it themselves, right? So that comes back to the, the analytics piece, right? How much analytics are you taking out of that environment to feed into a, an open source tool or the DNA center to be able to see um, how the environment is running? So, and the security. I mean, I think we can all agree that security is a lot bigger of a piece than um than ever what it was right which rightfully so i mean there's yeah the environment has changed security is a key component to all of it nowadays so all right now we're going to hit on the embedded controller a little bit more i'm going to go backwards because i skipped all right so i just wanted to hit on this briefly um like jay and i were talking uh this is kind of two different ways that you can do it. You can have an access port or a trunk port on the on the uh, um, on the AP itself, based on requirements, right? Um, so you can have um, on the left side here, 
where it's a access port and it's more your employees, contractors, and guests are on the same segment, right? Or from a security perspective, maybe you've got to have um, the different segments between. I would say probably the right side is typically where people are more going nowadays. And Jay, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think, again, it comes back to, from a security aspect. The business is saying, I don't want contractors or guests or employees all in the same environment, right? I need to be able to put restrictions in place and, and do that. But this is just kind of hitting on on with the embedded controller doing that. Yeah, it's pretty flexible. I mean, to, to that point, that's, that's a good call out. Um, a lot of wireless started out as just guests, right? We just need a way to support visitors and maybe customers, depending on the environment. Uh, nowadays, so much stuff's running on wireless that we, we don't want our corporate devices running on the same network that, that our guests and, and vendors and visitors are. Um, so in nearly every environment that, that's been segmented out. Um, but it's important to touch on the fact that even with the embedded wireless controllers, we have mechanisms in place to be able to do that. Yeah, yeah. All right. Now, all right, so the next one is, is um, as you can see here, this is talking about the Tri-Radio. I like this. I think it's really cool. And I could be completely wrong, right? Um, some people just might be like, oh yeah, whatever, not a big deal. But this is specific to the 9130. And, and this is one of those why I really like the 9130 and why this is kind of one of my go-to um, access points when I'm having a, a conversation with a customer is because of the whole tri-radio piece. So with the tri-radio piece essentially what it comes down to and you can kind of see on the right hand side when we start talking about an eight by eight uh access point um we're able to take that eight by eight um access point and break it into two four by fours um now again a lot of this plays into an environment right no eh, Typically, no environment's the same, right? Every environment's unique. Everyone's requirements are unique. So it all comes down to with the 9130 and your requirements from a business aspect, it gives you more flexibility where I can run an eight by eight, right? On my five gigahertz, or I can take that eight by eight and break it into two different five gigahertz channels to be able to provide that for, uh, um, my customers. I think that's cool. I think that's cool to be able to do that, right? Because when you start looking from an environment, and if I could take an access point and have two different five gigahertz channels to be able to offer, to me, it, it becomes down to the, um, it, it, it conceptually wise, it's the whole being able to provide that service for customers on the multiple channels, right? So then you're not getting the interference essentially between those, right? I mean, it, it, there's so much that comes down to that. I'm sorry, I get geeky on this. It's pretty cool. I think for the most part, um, we probably don't have that many clients today that can take advantage of the, the eight by eight, right? So I think a lot of customers that do go with the 9130s are splitting into the dual four by fours for now for, for that added capacity. Because it's a big density thing, right? As far as client density. Right. So and and it's nice it is, to be able to go back and forth. I mean, yeah, later on as we get more of those eight by eight clients. <laughs> well yeah. So it, it it again and it comes down to that whole business driver. So and this is just kind of some configuration piece. Um, to kind of go in and uh, and highlight how you're able to do that, right? So basically, it's it's disabled by default. You go in, you modify um, to be able to enable it, right? So you can see here from the five gigahertz chain, you go in and enable it, and then it actually will come in here where you can see, and then you have a slot too, right? So once you enable it and it's up and running, you'll see on an access point, I've got slot one and I've got slot two. Now you've got, you know, both sides. So I think it's pretty cool. Sorry, drinking my coffee. Just more configuration piece. And then I go through here. This is again. And I, Jay, I don't know if we'll share this stuff or if anyone ever wants to kind of go through this more. Um, 
if anyone gets in that environment, they, they need details around that. I mean, this is kind of the stuff that we can kind of um, help guide and, and share that information. I just wanted to kind of hit it in here because the whole tri radio thing to me is is cool because it gives you ability today and future. So I didn't know we could still do that on Air OS. So that's that's useful to know for brownfield deployments that are uh, you know still leveraging some Air OS today, but um, putting in the 9130s. It's a good call out. Yeah, so for a from a code perspective, um, we're still we still have some code that's developed on the on the Air OS, right? Um, there's still some out there. I mean, it's going to be around for for a while. Um, not everybody's going to run out and buy 9800 controllers. Um, so for a while, with having the newer access points, there'll be support between the two. So, but yeah, like you said, it's it's nice that they are still having some components that are key in the older OS. All right. All right, so the next thing I wanted to talk about was um, BSS coloring. Um, I don't know. I don't know. It's so a lot. The, the thing that gets tough with wireless, it, it's it's gauging where people are on on their understanding, right? So I don't know a lot of people that with the whole AX standard coming out that were like, "Wow, I'm going to go out and read the white paper on this and become pro totally proficient on on what the new standard means," right? Um, so the BSS coloring thing I wanted to hit on because again, when I look at AX, wireless is developed and, and changed over the, the course of time. And it's always been about, I need more speed, I need more speed, I need more speed, I need more speed, right? So and, and to me, I always had the feeling at once we hit the limitations on 2.4 on what we could get from a speed perspective, it was like, ah, oh, it's jump, toss it to the side. Now everything's gonna be the five gigahertz, right? With a dream, <laughs> yeah. There, there, there is, <laughs> there is, and and the thing I liked about AX to me, it seems like somebody took a step back and was like, "Hey, with AX, let's gain efficiencies in how we're doing our wireless, right? Let's see how we can turn the knobs and tweak and adjust to gain more efficiencies to get." better speeds for new and older clients. So to me, BSS coloring was one of those things that uh, I really like because it helps, right? Because if you look, in the, if you look on the right side, th that's kind of depicting uh, an environment where we have access points. Um, and typically think of a 2.4 where we have three channels right essentially you have three channels and a client in an environment where there are multiple access points um you, you're gonna get that overlapping right so from a client perspective it can be tough where i hear multiple access points on the same channel right so but the access points may not be able to see each other right so then it's a will the access points see a customer talking but it's not a customer that was associated with them. So then it gets into that whole interference um, and it can become a problem, right? So with the with BSS coloring, essentially what it comes down to is you start coloring from a client perspective, right? So then an access point could be on a channel and color blue and another access point could be in the same channel, but color red. Well, then that client essentially is colored blue or red. So then the access point knows Oh, I'm not getting any interference because that client isn't talking to me. I'm going to talk to my red clients or I'm going to talk to my blue clients, right? Does that make sense? How is the coloring determined? Do we actually put that into the header of the frame or? Yeah, let's see if I've got that in here. I didn't know if you had the, the diagram on. I know we had some diagrams floating around, but I mean, basically, yeah. it, it goes into the header of the management frame, right? So yeah, I think it has something in here on that. That's how the WAPs and the clients know, you know, what color we're talking about at any given time. Right. And again, that comes back to uh, um, efficiencies within within the standard, right? So 
I thought I had that in here. Someone else's. This is the RRM. Dang it, Jay. I thought I had it in there. Sorry, I'm throwing the hard questions out. No, no, you're fine. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, apparently I didn't get that in there. Uh, the configuration piece and, but yeah, you're right, right? It, it, it is the, it is the question of, of where that's going in there, right? So it's all a matter of in the header being able to embed that in there. So that way um, access point and client essentially are seeing that. And then just being able to, when I see something else and processing it, you can see, nope, that's not mine. You know, you don't have to listen to it, right? Yeah, it totally makes sense. I mean, it's it's a quick check when you have overlapping um, WAPs, which we always do. I mean, that's, that's always been an issue with, uh, Taking power on 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 WAPs and having to deal with interference between different WAPs. Um, you know, long gone are the days where we set everything to max power and set WAPs 20 feet apart and it, expect it to work. <laughs> and, and you know what? We actually um, um, you you hit it right on the head. Right? There are so many tweaks and adjust. I mean, within RRM. Um, there's adjustments to where an iPhone, the way an iPhone hears an access to the point and how it roams based on that. I mean, you can have settings on there from a power level to be able to determine how that, that access point power wise is that the default sometimes can be too far, right? So then, then a client may need more of a precise. So then you've got to adjust and tweak um that that setting from a power perspective to be closer so that way as an iphone or an android phone or whatever device it is as it's walking through the environment and adjusting it can hear a number of those access points so then it's not hanging on too long because it's not quite the signal strength at once so you're tweaking those which then makes the access point a little bit louder right so that way that client more seamlessly roams i mean it's Wireless is a fine tuning mechanism. I mean, it, it is it is crazy how I mean, so much is built on that on that client, right? And a lot of that comes down to understanding um, understanding how those clients work in an environment and what they do. It 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 it's crazy. It's yeah, it's tough. So, all right, I think we're good on on what we have. Some configuration pieces in here. It's the old arrow s you can see hey look enabled and bss coloring is enabled by default on all wi-fi 6 apps right should be yes yeah 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 or band all right now let's head on the rf asic all right, so like we said, I get really excited. Like the the RF ASIC, I feel like is a real differentiator between Cisco WAPs and and the competition, and even our lower grade WAPs. You know, the ninety one fifteens, ninety one seventeens. Um, kind of got to the point now where the price points on these, since they've come out, have gotten so low that we're really only talking twenties and up anymore, right? And I think that I think it is right. You, I mean, you you hit it specifically, right? I mean, we get into the whole. What's the big deal about the RF ASIC? Well, I mean, easily enough to say is, well, what is the purpose of the RF ASIC, right? I mean, the whole point of wireless is, is you've, wireless is you serve clients, right? But then in the midst of doing all of your, I'm serving clients, you have to go off channel to hear interference, um, all, all of the other components that help you make decisions on how you are acting as an access point, it, you have to go off channel to be able to do those things, right? So when you're off channel, you're not servicing customers, right? So, I mean, if I'm looking at a McDonald's, a McDonald's and I want my Big Mac, right? I mean, if the cash register guy is going in the back to grab a hamburger, 
well, he's not servicing me. And then I just need you to punch the button so that way I can get my, you know, my Big Mac, right? So it, it, to me, a lot of it comes into is the RFASIC is another team member in the environment that's helping to make more efficient, right? Because that RFASIC essentially is doing all of that work to where the other, uh, the other, the antenna, they're, they're servicing customers the RFASIC is doing all the back end work to be able to say uh, DFS, the the off channel work, um, rogue detection, WIPs, all of that is it's it's performing all those functions so that access point doesn't have to go off channel to be able to do that. Which, wow, that's it's huge, right? I mean, is that that like Jay, like you said, that's a game changer, right? You got an extra ASIC in that access point that's doing that, right? I I think it's I think that's pretty cool. I think, and like you said, yeah, I mean, I, you're absolutely right. I mean, we've done rogue detection and clean air and the stuff in the past, but either you had to dedicate a radio on the WAP to that, or um, you had to add the, we, we had like the WIPS modules, right? That would clip into to the WAPs. Um, you had to buy a separate piece of hardware to go into the WAP to do it, to serve as an additional radio. So now with the 9120s, 9130s, we have that RF ASIC baked in that can take care of that functionality without being a disruption to, to uh, serving clients. Yeah, yeah, because again, uh, wireless is only becoming even more and more important, right? So why would you want to have, why would you want to take something that's taking you to the next next level of what you're servicing for your customers and hinder it right off the bat from a, oh, I need to go off channel and do this and that, right? Let go to the 9120s, 9130s, leverage that ASIC and be good to go. Look at that, a pretty picture of the inside of an access point. <laughs> so yeah, it's a picture of where they- Do not the try ASIC. this at home. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, you can see where it is. Not much outside of that. Now this gets to a, this is where we start looking at performance numbers of um, throughput uh, with those access points as compared to the wave twos. So the wave twos would be um, um, 2800s, 3800s, 4800s. Well, what do they get on that side? 2800. It's all supported AC wave too. So yeah, I mean, I think it's a pretty good comparison. I know the, the, this, this is a great graph too, because I know the marketing slides like to say Wi-Fi six, you can do 1.2 gigabits per second. We all know the truth around that, right? Oh my goodness. <laughs> the theoretical maximum we will never see in our actual production wireless environments. Um, so I, I like seeing these tests where, you know, they'd actually done client testing. Yeah. And it, again, it, it all, to me, the whole Wi-Fi 6 piece is efficiencies, right? How do I take the environment, tweak and adjust and get a little bit better performance out of it, right? Um, so, you know, as, you, as you're building an environment, as you're going there, it, a lot of people did the whole, well, I don't have Wi-Fi 6 clients right now, which I get, right? Um, but the efficiencies that you're going to start gaining, right, from uh, the RF ASIC, from BSS coloring, for all of these components that you're able to put into an environment, the the gains that you're going to get from an efficiency perspective helps, right? Because any little bit from a wires perspective helps, and then it just positions you going forward. All right. So this we start getting at the whole intelligent capture, which another is another piece that we get with the with the ASIC um, information feeding into uh, uh, DNA center assurance. Um, yeah, I mean, again, taking information from an access point, being able to feed it to a tool to be able to say how, what is that, what is that client seeing? What is that environment seeing? And leveraging that information to be able to make intelligent decisions. So this is just some slides on that. I'll pause just a little bit so people can see and not just be like, click, 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 click. 
I like the the RF captures DNA center. I mean, I, I think this is pretty cool stuff. And and clean air. I mean, I've got a good clean air story. Um, I can't remember where I was at, but we had we had installed a WAP in a location, and everything was fine and dandy. I think it was new construction, whatever it was. And uh, like months later, we started getting complaints from wireless users, especially like midday. And uh, clean air started picking up all sorts of like really whack um, interference. And it was, it was super cloudy, just on and off, like 30 to 60 seconds at a time for, you know, the middle, like two to three hours of the day. And uh, finally, like we, we messed around with this thing for so long. We were like, someone needs to go on site and just like look around, see what's going on. They had installed microwave ovens right under the WAP. Like they decided to leverage that area as a break room. <laughs> nice. <laughs> like, oh, well, that probably explains it. You know, sure enough, like you can connect via wireless and you turn on the microwave, start running a speed test that's, you know, 800K or whatever. So uh, clean air is awesome for figuring out stuff like that. Um, there's so many different different interferers out there. You know, cordless phones aren't aren't as common now, but certainly were were a, a burden to us many years ago. Uh, Bluetooth, microwave. Um, there's all sorts of proprietary wireless stuff out there now. Um, so yeah, being able to have clean air to, to help sort that out um, can really help you track down and and take care of those interferers. Yes, yes, yes. It's all about data, right? It's all about getting that data and. Being able to leverage it. And DFS, whatever. Fast locating performance. That's another thing that we're getting that's coming. <clears throat> All right. All right. So this kind of gives a, a breakdown of older right so we're and i mean on this one we're going all the way back to 3600s um hyperlocate so i think everyone knows what the hyperlocate piece is right so that is the able to get very specific within feet of where a person is um so we've got that on our 4800 access points um they're the as far as from a wi-fi 6 piece um um the B, I haven't heard any commitments out of the BU of where we're at on that. I've heard some rumors of trying to do some stuff, but but it's, something's got to get within the next few months and released on that, right? Because, I mean, the 4800G gets some pretty amazing accuracy on that. Um, but again, it comes back to from a Wi-Fi 6 piece, where are we at on that? And, and when are we going to start being able to do that from a Wi-Fi 6? So there should be some developments in that in the next few months. So the hyperlocate and fast locate, we see a lot of marketing teams using um, in conjunction with the uh, CMX or, or now DNA spaces, um, you know, for retail or fast food or any really customer serving industries. It's really useful to marketing teams to figure out, like, where are these clients going when they enter our building, right? Are they going over to this rack here or are they going over to that rack there? Um, how long do they spend, you know, standing there looking at that display or how long are they standing up there at the cash register trying to get their Big Mac, you know, from the team member that isn't serving them or <laughs> whatever the case <laughs> is. Um, so, yeah, the, there, there's a lot of technology that we probably won't cover today as far as that goes, with DNA spaces and all that. But, um there's some really cool stuff we can do uh, both on the Cisco side and, and on the Meraki side with uh, client location. Yeah, the hyperlocate thing. I like that one because we we have a hospital that leverages that and it is a, well, where's this crash cart? Where's this pump, right? So, or do we have assets that are leaving the facility, right? So then you start tagging these things and then you can, you can get very accurate on where that stuff is. So, um, I think from a business aspect, as you start having resources that cost and are very important to the business, you know, the hyperlocate can become key because you may only have one or two of something and you need to know where it always is. So I think that's a good, I think that's a good piece for that. On the healthcare side, we see folks, um, some customers use it with uh, like uh, baby wards, right? Newborn babies, they put like an RF bracelet on them. And then yep. if they disappear, they can track them down. <laughs> Not that that should theoretically ever happen, but yeah. Um, oh man, you know what? Another uh, another protection. 
Yeah, no, that's crazy. So when we had our first, uh, our first kid, uh, you never think of that, right? When you don't have kids, there are so many things you never think of. Um, but when they came in and talked about, you know, why the bracelet was on our kid and, and the whole thing, it like freaks you out. Like what people take kids? What? Huh? Yeah. So it was, it was crazy. All right. So that's the slide. Um, um, we've got what 18 more minutes. Uh, so I'm gonna stop sharing that. Uh, there's a lot more. Couple, we can talk. Uh, yeah, there's a lot more. To share. Yeah. So there, there's the, what, another thing I wanted to hit on was, uh, OFDMA. Um, but we really don't have time for that. I'm not going to go into that. I mean, that's a, that's a huge, oh, wow. That's that. So let me pull up this website. All right, let me know if you're able to see this. Yep, I got it. This is understanding the 9800 controller, which you may stop and be like, what? And it's a controller well as jay and i have said we are now ios xe which means it's completely different the way it feels the way it looks it is different right and typically people are not too keen on it's different right usually you find your routine your method of doing something and typically people like that and they like i like my coffee this way right uh, you make it a little bit different and someone's like it tastes different i don't like this coffee uh but it it this document I really like because it goes through, and I'll, we'll, we'll get this shared out so everyone has it, um, but it steps through the difference of, of the 9800 controller because the way they're doing it, the way it's built, it, it, it is different. It is a different thought process, right? So from an access point perspective, you have policy tags, and within that, that's where you're defining your SSID, and your profile, right? Well, then you have a site tag that's on that. Well, that's where you're doing local mode or Flex Connect, um, the AP profile, all of those components go into your site tag. And then you have an RF tag, which that is where you're then going in and saying, here's my 2.4 gigahertz profile and my five gigahertz profile. Um, to me, you've got those three, those three, but it's completely different on how you're doing that, right? So. Again, we'll get this shared out because I want to make sure everyone has this as they're going to look at the 9800 because it, it, typically people are going to have that knee jerk of, well, this is different. I don't like it. And, and, and it won't be a positive feedback, right? We want you to have this. This information is out there. It is just a different way of looking and how you're handling um, this. And it breaks everything down, right? I mean, you can go in here. We got RF tags. You can see below here all of these different profile pieces that you're able to do within that. It was that way with Air OS, right? All of that information and all that stuff was there too. This is just a different way of being able to do it, right? Um, another thing I'll hit on down below. I mean, there's a lot of information here. This kind of steps through it. You have that. But what I wanted to do... Uh, Hang on. Hold. I need suspense music, Jay. Dun, 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 dun. All right. Now so. we, I know we uh, we have a config translator baked into the 9800 controller. Do you have any feedback on that? I mean, are folks using that and having success? I've, I've had a few people that have used it for. It's still important to come here and learn the logic of the new iOS XE wireless configs. Um, don't just translate it and be like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> no, <laughs> like you need to understand how it all works. But Yeah, and a lot of times not everything translates, right? You're, I, I, very rarely have I ever seen a tool that says, I'm going to take your old configuration, translate it into a new configuration, and it hit 100%, right? It, that doesn't happen. You're going to have some configuration that doesn't go across. Um, I've lever I've got, we've got a tool that I've leveraged, um, and it's been fine. Um, but again... 
it all comes back to understanding what the old one is doing, where the new pieces are within the environment, and the different tweaks and adjustments, right? Because there, there's a little bit different way of being able to do it. Um, this here is, so what I have up here is as you're building, right? Um, there's a design phase, right? Where you're able to go through and define all these pieces and do it. It's kind of cool, right? I mean, if you've got your profiles, your policies, your tag, all of those pieces built and done, this design phase lets you go in and basically click, 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 apply, and, and it's going, right? So again, it's that ease, right? It's that, that day two piece, right? You've already put the time and the work of developing the architecture within the environment, and you've got a a admin or someone assisting you with deployment and you've given them the hey for this site here's the parameters that we need for it and they can go in and go into this design phase and be able to implement that for you right so you're not having to do every single thing so it's pretty cool um again that's another one of these when you're navigating here you can see config setup advanced start now so it's pretty cool Let's see here Look at that plus signs. You click that and it does stuff. <laughs> I like that. I like how it breaks it down. I mean, I, I do think it's more intuitive now. It, it's just hard, you know, being used to the way we've done it for years with AirOS, moving to something new. But exactly, um, I think if I didn't know what I know about AirOS, the, the new iOS XE config model is much more intuitive. Yeah, yeah. It's cool. It's cool. So we'll get this shared out to everybody so they have it, right? Because I think this is an important document for people to have in their arsenal when they when they go to do this stuff. So, but yeah, I mean, I don't know if anyone's got questions or, or Jay, is there something else I need to hit on or, or what's your thoughts? No, I think we're set, man. I haven't seen any questions come through uh, the chat or the Q&A. Um, as always, we'll send out a, uh, a follow-up with the recording from this um, and links to, to this document and some of the data sheets for the 9800s and the 9100s. Um, our next multicast in two weeks will be <laughs> an interesting one. I, I drew a short straw in the group, so uh, we're going to do a hot wings challenge. Um, we're going to have Lance back in a couple weeks, and he's going to you're going to ask me some questions, do some Q&A on some uh, networking and, and IT industry hot takes. You know, uh, some of the questions he bounced off of me. He didn't want to give me all of them, Russell. I think he, he wants me to be surprised by some of these. But, uh, you know, one of them he gave me was, do certifications matter? And I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> you know, give me hot water questions like that. No, it, it'll be a fun time. I'm going to eat hot wings, like really, really hot hot wings, and answer questions. So uh, I'm sure the term hot ones off YouTube is copyrighted, and I can't use that when I advertise this. But it'd be kind of yeah. like that style. So um, you yeah, have that'll the dab. be fun. I have, the, I, I have the last dab, yeah. You really? That is awesome. from the show. And, yeah, I'm sure we'll end on the last dab, and I'll cry on web this will be I, the height of my career in it yeah i've seen <laughs> i've seen that show and man some of the people on there when they do just their reaction and just like I like donut. yes you can have a donut <laughs> <laughs> working from home is a good time yeah awesome. well with that i think we'll wrap it up i'll send out a follow-up um, email with this info and the recording once we get that posted and invites to uh, our next session. But thanks everybody for joining and hope you all have a good weekend. Thanks again, Russell. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, no problem.